everybody. This is uh, Glenn Woodworth from the Society in Education and Anesthesia, and uh, this is another one of our webcast series on innovations in anesthesia education. And today we've got part two of a pod uh, or a webcast. I, I always use the term podcast, but now in the age of Zoom, we're doing these as webcasts. And today my guests are Albert Tsai. He's a clinical assistant professor at Stanford University in the Division of Cardiothoracic Anesthesia. And I've got uh, Tom Caruso, who's a clinical professor, also at Stanford University in the Division of Pediatric Anesthesia. And the title of today's talk is Sharing Technology. How can I do that here? And uh, Tom, uh, I'm going to start with you because, uh, you know, Stanford has long been an innovator, uh, you know, sitting there in the Silicon Valley, you know, harvesting and developing all that wonderful technology. And uh, I understand that you were concerned about uh, how the uh, how the peons like me out in the forest of Oregon could use some of that awesome stuff uh, or that you've developed or that other people have developed. So tell us a little bit about your journey of, you know, what brought you to this project. So uh, thanks for having us, uh, Glenn. We, I'd say maybe five, six years ago, we're um hanging out in our preoperative area and one of my co-founders dr sam rodriguez of the stanford chariot program which stands for Char uh, childhood anxiety reduction through innovation and technology he was using a projector to distract children prior to anesthesia and i said to sam i said you know sam that's wonderful and that that one patient really loves it but i'm looking at all the other patients in pre-op and they're really jealous how can we take that projector based um intervention and bring it to everybody. So we did a quality improvement project and we brought the projector based uh, technology to all patients. And that led to a little bit of uh, media attention, which led to a very generous philanthropic grant. And with that grant, we said, well, what about the older kids who aren't as dazzled by projectors? And uh, we started to get into virtual reality. And one thing led to another. And all of a sudden, here we are five, six years later, and we're developing virtual reality applications, projector based applications, and augmented reality applications in multiple different lanes, including anxiety relief, pain relief, rehabilitation, and education. Um, along, the, along the way, we've uh, spoken to lots of our colleagues about this, and we feel one of our core values at the Stanford Chariot Program is that we've been very fortunate to have generous donors who have supported our work. And we want to share and pass that on to other uh, colleagues, not just at Stanford, um, like Dr. Sai here, um, but at other institutions as well. Right, so, because one of the thoughts would be, you know, A, you develop your technology into a commercial product, which others can buy, you know, or, you know, it's uh, always a problem. You know, whenever you develop anything at a university on the university time, um, you usually have an office of technology transfer or intellectual property. And, and there's a lot of restrictions on uh, anything that you do, either in terms of developing it as a product or just being able to try and share it for free with other parties. So tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what your thoughts were about that. Right. So we were able to uh, demonstrate that although there was clinical utility um, of these applications and educational utility of these applications that there were a large number of institutions that were not willing to engage in um, financially bound subscription services, not from us, but judging by other opportunities on the market. So we're very fortunate that after a lot of communication with Stanford Office of Technology Licensing, uh, they allowed us to distribute this at no cost to other institutes. And originally we went directly from Stanford to the other institutes, but as we continue to expand, um, we had to reconsider that distribution method. Um, and ultimately what we landed on was developing a nonprofit. The nonprofit is called Invinci Kids. And through that nonprofit, Stanford says, okay, we're gonna give a license agreement to Invinci Kids and through Invincent Kids, you guys can distribute, uh, handle all that, all that paperwork of uh, distributing to any institute that may want access to these technologies that you've developed. So let me, let me just make sure I clarify this. So the first thing is that Stanford has to license the technology to uh, the nonprofit. And, you know, there's a lot of paperwork involved with that in terms of what's the license and what are the restrictions on the 
who owns the intellectual property and what are the rights. So that's why it's a licensing that's going to allow you some rights. And it sounds like what it does is it allows the, the nonprofit now the right to then sublicense out technology out from the nonprofit. So it's, they get to offload the burden of the paperwork uh, for all that sub, sub licensing to your nonprofit, it sounds like. So you, you're going to have to have your own lawyers. <laughs> Which we do. Um, and, they're, and they're available for, your, for other institutes as well. And what I mean by that is Invincent Kids is set up not to be just a distributor uh, or sub licensor of technologies developed at Stanford. But we envision um, a nonprofit where if there are people at other institutions who have technology that's sort of tied up in ownership at the institution without the, let's say, they're not able to bring it to a commercial product and sell it, um, we at Invincicates are also open to having other people distribute through us and our lawyers will um, work with you uh, free of charge to put take care of that licensing paperwork between you and your institution so that you can set up a similar uh, scenario, or you can utilize Invincent Kids to receive technologies if you're not into distributing. We see ourselves as sort of like a YouTube where, um, at Invincent Kids, where YouTube doesn't make the videos, but they provide a venue for people to get their homegrown videos out to the world. Yeah, so that's fascinating. So in the one hand, and we'll talk about this in a moment. You've, you've got some amazing technology that you were uh, able to license from Stanford about uh, virtual reality, rea reality and augmented reality for use in anesthesia education. And I want to now use it here at OHSU. And so we can work out a licensing agreement and your lawyers are going to help me. Of course, our lawyers are, you know, the OHSU lawyers will have to be involved, yep. but, uh, you know, and get a sub license for using that at no cost so that our university could then begin using that technology. That's awesome. But then on the other hand, what I heard was if I were to develop something, of course, I wish I had that creative mind that you guys do and develop something amazing, then I could also, you know, I don't want to commercialize the product. I want to get it out there. And I could then work with your organization to, through our university to license it to you. And then you could be responsible for helping other organizations take take advantage of it. Is that correct? Exactly. And the really interesting thing is, you know, we're already at almost 20 institutes so if let's say you had that technology um your technology would be covered with our licenses that we already have in place so you could instantaneously call up your friends at uh, another hospital and say hey guess what i know you guys have signed with invincent kids um you now can use the technology i've developed at ohsu um, through this agreement through Invincent Kids. And you oh, so it's a master agreement that covers all of the technology available within Invincent Kids. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Well, let's take a case, uh, case in point. Although Al is also at Stanford, um, you've got some, uh, some uh, VR technology and now Al wants to use it in his project. So Al, can you give us, we'll use you as a case study. So what was the technology you were after and uh, how to, briefly, you know, how did you use it? Well, what I was interested in is um, using his AR technology, not VR, uh, okay. to uh, create a high fidelity simulation for the purpose of education and training for my res residents and fellows. So you promise not to laugh at us that use the terminology incorrectly. So <laughs> augmented reality versus virtual reality. I just remember that I was taught to never use the word VR when I'm being AR and vice versa. So. <laughs> 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 okay, great. I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> so what we did was uh, we I essentially, you know, uh, used Tom's technology to um, uh, carry out a study to uh, create this simulation and uh, wanted to get feedback to and, and publish the data to uh, in a qualitative way to establish this, uh, this as a supplement uh, potentially alternative to in-person inside to uh, simulation. So I'm, unfortunately, I'm not as versed with the technology, you know, as I, I could imagine all of its possibilities, but I'm a regional anesthesiologist. And so let's say I wanted to use this augmented reality technology to somehow develop something. So I'm actually going to add on to your product. I'm not just going to um, use the technology, but maybe I'm going to add on to it. And I, I was super smart. And I was able to add on to that technology and now create some augmented 
um, reality to teach residents on how to do um, nerve blocks. That would be something that the sublicensing would allow. Is that correct? So you, if you want to change the source code, that'd be called a derivative and um, that you're not allowed to make a derivative of any of the software as it's owned by Stanford. However, what we do, and Al is a, a perfect use case of this, um, even though he's at our own institute, Al came to us and said, you know, for that simulator, I really need central venous pressure. I need arterial waveforms. Um, and, you know, this is what I need to do my simulation. So back at Stanford Chariot Program and within the Stanford University, we made those iterations for them. So if you're, if you say, hey, guys, I've used this error simulation, I love it, but I really would love the ability to XYZ, um, you reach back out to the original owner. In this case, it's Stanford, but you could see if there were other softwares from other institutes being covered, um, you always want to reach out to the original owner before you make any derivatives of someone's product that you don't know. Because it, it could be uh, different, different owners may have different views on whether they allow you to, their licensing allows you to create derivative products. Exactly. If it's open source or not. Yeah. Every institute has different rules around that. All right. But this could be, a, this is certainly a mechanism for faculty to jumpstart development of products because they, they may feel, you know, our projects, they may feel that there's just no way I could even start doing a AR or VR project because I, you know, it just takes so much to get to the point that you're at. So uh, is there some sort of catalog or how do people know, you know, you go to the, go to your website. So tell us a little bit of how to, how to access that. I don't know if it shows up in the chat, but you could um, put on there. How can people look at what technologies are available to them that they might be able to use in their projects? You want to say that? Um, you can go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, you can start by going to invincikids.org. That's our website and reaching okay. out to us. Um, once uh, we make contact, we talk about uh, the different opportunities that are there. The thing is, is that we've really, um, a lot of our technologies are uh, dependent upon providers. For example, we did not set out to make an augmented reality simulator that was freestanding, like you just put a put a participant in and they walk away. It's dependent on the instructor because we believe that that education that um, you, Glenn, bring or Albert brings to the simulation, that that's a vital component. You can't hardwire that in. And same goes for all of our VR technology. So if we have an anxiolytic or a rehab, they're all built hand in hand. So we start with uh, what's your clinical scenario or your educational scenario that you want to use this for. And then we're able to sort of guide you down different products that we uh, distribute that may be able to suit your needs. I think this is oh, sorry, the products themselves are would not necessarily just be used for research or other things that I was going to do. It could be something as simple as, wow, you mean we could put your headsets on our kids in our hospital and they could start. I mean, it could be something as simple as really using it as a product as opposed to using it in a in a project or further development. Is that true as well? The, the majority of uh, people use it clinically um, or educationally, not necessarily for research. And okay. they're developing names for themselves as, you know, the program director, program manager of that XR thing. And they have all these technologies that they just gained access to at no cost to help uh, facilitate and jumpstart that, that interest in that career. Awesome. Okay. That's, that's really, that's awesome. Um, yeah. So I, I can, I, I think that. I think you've done a wonderful thing by lowering the barriers to entry to advanced technology use in projects um, for, you know, because, you know, how many of our junior faculty are coming in with expertise in some of these areas, um, th which brings me to the question, you may have just given me a nuclear reactor to use, but I have no idea how to use nuclear reactors. Uh, <laughs> what is your customer support and implementation like to, to help us? take advantage of the, you know, technology that you now have put into my hands. Sure. So, um, <laughs> uh, we have a, um, wide variety of videos, uh, video tutorials that we've created as well as, uh, user guides, um, beyond the user guides and video tutorials, we will work one-on-one -on -one with, uh, sort of a champion within your institute to make sure that they are fast on understands how to use it. 
Um, we don't provide at the elbow support as a for free nonprofit where you can call us 24 seven and be like, heck, I, I can't get this to work. Um, but we do, um, as you're coming on board, ensure that at least one or multiple people, whoever's starting on that uh, core team is facile with the technologies that we distribute. Do you have some sort of uh, chat groups or anything like that of, you know, shared experiences of other people using technologies that are available again to help them with, you know, frequently asked questions and support stuff? Sure. So the, I, the Invincta Kids Consortium is um, a website and an area for sharing of those ideas that's been built out, but not fully realized yet. Um, there are, um, there are things that you have to do to ensure moderation and, you know, what's being posted um, regarding when you, when you go into that next direction of people sharing. And we want to make sure that we, res we respect everyone's privacy and people, and we have the resources available to, to moderate what's being posted. So right now, um, although the idea of the Invincta Kids Consortium is a real one, it, it exists as a directory, directory of people for you to reach out um, personally to um, outside of the Invincta Kids organization. And so we um, kind of firm up how we could facilitate that communication within the institution while ensuring uh, everyone's protection and privacy. You know, and I think it'd be interesting would be sort of like a 15 minute um, or maybe a 10 minute grand rounds presentation, you know, everybody has faculty development grand round sessions that are, are some sessions throughout the year that are gen, uh, dedicated to faculty development. It seems to me like that'd be a really interesting thing as a promo and put out a little, maybe one, maybe a video that you have, but, you know, here's all these different products and here's how they were used just to stimulate people's creative juices to think, wow, if I had that, you know, go mull it over and think about how could I use that maybe in a different way, that might be, you know, something exciting. To, again, I'm always interested in how we can get junior faculty going and how to make them successful. So I think most of them wouldn't even know that this resource exists to them. So I'd like to some way try to, um, to help you get that word out. So that would be one thought. And then the second thing is it takes a village, right? This will be more successful if people that develop things want to deliver their technology into into this, um, you know, shared distribution network. So I think that's something we got to work on too. Is how can we reach out to the um, the other universities to try to, you know, get our our innovative partners in and out outside of anesthesia, right? You know, this could be a huge this could be a huge global phenomenon, uh, Tom. So I, I thank you. Applaud you on the work you've done. So mm -hmm. the next thing I want to move to and spend our last few minutes on is I always uh, talk about, you know. Let's talk about not specifically about, you know, how this project can be used, because that's that's been a great discussion. But again, thinking about our junior faculty, how did you even get there? What barriers did you have to overcome to develop your project? Um, you know, I bet this has been a large part of your life, actually, now. Yeah, it's certainly been a large part of our life. Um, I would say that words of advice are are number one is trying to understand the boundaries within your system. Every institution has um, red tape. That's normal. It's everywhere. Don't be frustrated and think that it's going to be any better anywhere else. I mean, maybe some things will be better, but you look the other way, some things are probably not going to be as optimal. So um, every institution has its red tape. Um, be patient. Um, take small bites and understand that these sorts of programs and technologies aren't developed overnight. It takes years and to just think about reasonable time bound projects that you can at least just get completed, get behind you and then continue to move on to the next thing. The other thing that I would note is that I have personally found and at the Stanford Chariot program, everyone involved is there will become a time where you need to decide, is this a you thing or is this an us thing? Um, and the more open and willing you are to collaborate and um, help other people, you will lose nothing, uh, especially when you're starting off and um, you're trying to find your place. I know that sometimes there's a sentiment of, you know, I need this to be my thing because this is how I'm going to get promoted. But actually, if it's our thing and um, your chairs and other people in the household see how open you are to 
to creating um, mentorship and collaborative opportunities, not just within your division department, but within other departments uh, that will actually facilitate and accelerate your growth more so than kind of going the other direction and trying to like keep your name stamped around it. Um, that, that was fantastic advice. I'm going to encourage every junior faculty to rewatch that last two minutes, play it over 10 times because that was incredible device, uh, advice from, uh, I think, a proven mentor. And so I really, really encourage you to think about um, what Tom just said. Now, Tom, I'm going to close this with probably one of the most important things that happened to you in this project, which was you got a philanthropic, a philanthropic donor which really helped jumpstart you. Um, you know, I know you're surrounded by, uh, by donors, but I think that's probably true. We just don't know about them, you know, in our own uh, communities. Can you give our junior faculty any advice on, you know, how that happened? How can they help try to, you know, reach out or somehow get connected with funding that can help jumpstart a project? I think that's a wonderful question and kind of riffing off what I just said about being open and generous with your time and resources um, as you're developing your program, whether it be educational, clinical, whatever it might be, every single institute, anyone listening right now, they have a foundation and the foundation at your institute, they help uh, bring in philanthropic dollars to that hospital and they are actually distributing them unbeknownst to you to other projects and it's happening right now today. So I would, my immediate advice would be to create your narrative, your very open, generous narrative about what you're doing to help improve patient care through the education of others um, and how this is improving patient care and meet with your foundation. Um, reach out to your foundation and talk to set up a meeting and talk to them about what you're doing and what your vision are. And then lean on use cases. Talk about the Stanford Chariot program. Say this is what can be. This is what can happen here. If and then once the foundation learns about you, uh, my guess is in some cases they'll keep an eye out when a donor comes in and say, you know what, you know Al doing this over the Stanford Adult Hospital. If he's met with the foundation, they're like he's a guy that that donor might want to connect with. So I'm I'm going to ask a stupid question, but. Um, from the perspective of the foundation, right, you're most successful on project. I think my dog really likes that advice that you just gave. But from the perspective of a of, of foundation, I always think in a negotiation, if you can better understand what they're thinking, um, are they looking at trying to find good projects that will help attract donors? You know, because that's something important. So even if that donor doesn't just end up funding your project, they'll maybe, you know, put generalized funds that can fund more than your project or, you know, what is it that the foundation is thinking? So how I, how I can, uh, you know, I can tickle their buttons. Yeah. The motivation for every donor is, is different. And um, would you want to try to demonstrate to the foundation is just what a change and a transformative change, what you're doing may result in improved patient care. Most donors who are reaching out to hospitals have some experience in their past where they want to see patient care improved. And if that donor happens to have a background in technology or a background um, in the area in which you work, then that may be a great fit. And what the foundation wants to see is that you're going to be a good steward of that, of that grant. So what is not good is when a donor makes a, makes a, a directed donation to some group or a person and then it sort of fizzles out and there's not much to show on the flip end. So having demonstration of success, showing how you're going to continue to be a good steward of the money, you're going to be open and generous with your time, open and generous with your technologies and sort of sharing your vision with the donor and being in good communication with them is, um, I think, generalized advice um, that, that your foundation would be looking for. Do you generally interact with the foundation itself or do you, or are you interacting with the with the, they put you to sort of link you up with the donor, you're actually having direct communication with the donor as well. Yeah, directly with the donor once and if the foundation thinks that you may be a good fit for that donor. Awesome. Well, I apologize uh, for the dog barking in the background. He's just super excited about your project. And uh, so uh, I want to thank both Al and uh, Tom for, for being on this webcast because this was a fascinating one. 
and very different than some of the other podcasts, but I think it can be really helpful um, to junior faculty that are looking to start projects or hopefully that will touch some faculty that are interested in, uh, in interested in donating uh, projects into into this consortium. So thank you so much for for being on our program. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Glenn.